Okay, uh, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my uh, delight and great pleasure to welcome you here to Robinson College uh, for our annual public policy lecture organized by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy uh, together with the Cambridge Info in Public Policy program. Every year, it has been our honor to host a distinguished guest speaker whose work intersects with the major issues uh, that we address in our research and policy engagement at the Bennett Institute, whether that be on issues ranging from uh, the regulation of artificial intelligence and digital services, to the future of work and welfare, to the challenge of reducing spatial and place-based inequalities, uh, to the pathway to the green transition, or the challenges that confront the future of democracy and democratic government decision-making processes. And these are all respects, of course, in which the Bennett Institute is proud to boast a stellar record of real-world research impact, thanks to our connections with global policy leaders and leading uh, government and international organizations. These are also, of course, topics on which we can expect to learn a great deal uh, from tonight's distinguished guest speaker, Professor Danny Roderick. However, before introducing uh, Professor Roderick formally, uh, please allow me to just make a couple of very brief housekeeping requests. Number one, first of all, unless we have made an absolute catastrophic planning error, there are no fire alarms uh, scheduled uh, for the next 90 minutes. So if you do hear a fire alarm, please, 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 uh, do not just assume uh, that that is a student uh, who has uh, overcooked their toast. Uh, please join with us, uh, make your way uh, out to the assembly point uh, where we can all learn together uh, whether or not somebody has carbonized their evening cooking. Secondly, uh, for those of you who also live, work, teach, and study in the Allison Richard building, you may look at your phones now and discover an absolute technological miracle, the miracle of phone reception. Uh, but this also means that if you have been hiding from your colleagues your embarrassing ringtone successfully up until now, don't ruin it tonight. Uh, please, please uh, put your phones onto silent mode uh, for the course of uh, today's uh, session, if you are able. Thirdly, um, you are absolutely welcome to take photos, uh, but please do not use flash photography. And finally, uh, there will, of course, be a Q&A at the end, so please save up your questions uh, for them. And uh, also, uh, at that moment, please uh, take note of the fact that this event is being recorded, uh, so don't uh, risk uh, becoming the... Yes, okay, smashing. Good, thank you, technical team. Uh, so, uh, please uh, don't risk becoming a Cambridge heckler meme. Uh, make sure that you ask a polite question that is short and to the point, and is also, in fact, a question. So, that part out of the way, it is now my great honor to introduce to you our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Danny Roderick, the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Harvard John F. Kennedy School of Government. To many of you, of course, Danny will need no introduction, as his hugely influential work will have introduced him well in advance, as for the better part of three decades, Danny has been a leading thinker globally on trade, development, and political economy, and along the way has picked up such prestigious accolades as the Leontief Prize, grants from the Carnegie, Ford, and Rockefeller Foundations, and in 2020, uh, a nomination from the Pope to join the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Danny's topic for tonight is whether we need a new uh, paradigm for economic policy. And I can think of uh, no more appropriate title uh, for our guest speaker, as Danny is an example of a scholar who himself is paradigm shifting. All too often, academics start their careers by embracing popular theories, uh, and then cling to those stubbornly as those theories accumulate ever more outliers and anomalies. Roderick is that rare and valuable example of a scholar who took the opposite track as his once maverick skepticism regarding capital mobility, trade, and deregulation have little by little returned to mainstream acceptance. But that, of course, uh, means that uh, while Danny has the ear of uh, global policy leaders worldwide, uh, and as governments dust off their toolkits on industrial policy and trade regulations, 
a new set of questions is being raised. How do we ensure that such policies achieve equitable growth and redistribution instead of geopolitical leverage or zero-sum mercantilism? And as the old Washington consensus fades from view, is all we are left with a mere Washington confusion, as Professor Roderick wrote almost two decades ago, with nothing more than a panoply of bespoke policy solutions to be applied in each individual context? Or are we now witnessing a new phase with the emergence of a new economic consensus? Well, uh, here to answer those questions and more is our special guest for tonight. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Danny Roderick. Thank you, Rob. Thank you to the uh, Bennett Institute uh, for um, the invitation. It's very nice to be here. Um, uh, I, the, the title um, of my talk, The Renew the New Paradigm for Economic Policy, um, I suppose if, if uh, you're not an economist, um, has an obvious answer. Uh, um, you know, why even ask the um, if, if you're an economist, on the other hand, uh, it might um, uh, be somewhat uh, uncomfortable. Um, uh, maybe uh, many economists have decided not to come on account of the title. But there is a, a kind of a wrinkle here, which is that I'm going to be talking about a new paradigm for economic policy as opposed to a new paradigm for economics. And that's probably may end up making me more enemies um, than, uh, than I would have liked. Um, but I'm going to argue uh, that, yes, the answer to the question I'm posing is yes, but actually that's a different than answering the question about whether we need a new paradigm for economics. And um, I'm going to argue, although that's not my main point, uh, that we can do very well with a new paradigm even within uh, the constraints of, of mainstream uh, neoclassical economics. Uh, so that's really, you know, a, a, a soft theme that I want to highlight maybe at the outset and give those of you who are looking for a reconsideration of all economics uh, from scratch maybe a chance to leave uh, the auditorium uh, right now if you're so inclined. But I will try to outline um, the case for a new um, uh, perspective on economic policy, which I think is better at, at, at um, uh, answering the challenges um, of our time. Um, but before I do that, I, I, I think also need to make the case a little bit about uh, why we need um, this new paradigm for economic policy, because making that case makes it a little bit clearer as to what uh, new, that new paradigm uh, ought to look like. Um, we are, of course, I come from the other Cambridge, um, and uh, it's quite possible that we're discussing different sets of issues than, um, than you're discussing over here. Uh, but it's really hard to uh, understate how the conversation on uh, economic policy has really shifted uh, in the United States. And that really spans um, a very wide um, gamut of areas. Um, uh, from corporate taxation to industrial policy to climate transition to labor markets, um, how we talk about big techs, big tech and platforms, how we talk about trade policy and globalization, um, and even sort of that, that last uh, bastion of uh, conservative uh, economics, sort of how we talk about uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Um, so the conversation is, 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 has changed. Um, ideas about economic policies across a very wide range of domains are in flux. But why talk about a paradigm? Um, economists, in fact, actually don't uh, use that term uh, very much. Um, and I want to be explicit about uh, the sense in which I'm using uh, the term uh, paradigm here. And by paradigm, uh, I mean a kind of a, a, a meta model. Um, that uh, is very rarely explicitly articulated or tested, uh, yet uh, um, underlies how we think about the economy and its relation to society and the polity. So it's a kind of a, a, a general orientation 
of for policy. Um, if I have to put it in a sort of more technical language of contemporary economic economics, I would say it's a set of maintained assumptions um, that are sort of assumptions that are never directly challenged. They are maintained assumptions about um, the nature and the prevalence of market failures, uh, about what governments uh, can achieve um, and what they intend, uh, what kind of capabilities they have, um, about the possibilities of collective action, um, and uh, importantly about what are the binding constraints, the most important obstacles to achieving better economic performance um, uh, and, and, and improved economic prosperity. So these maintained assumptions, along with a kind of an implicit prioritization of different kinds of values that might be in tension with each other, um, efficiency versus equity, um, uh, poverty reduction, resilience, overall stability, personal freedom, uh, social cohesion. Uh, these are all ultimately objectives uh, that we have to decide as a society um, um, how much to value, uh, how much weight to put on one on top of the, uh, versus the other uh, when they can be in tension with each other. So um, what are the practical, um, what practical form does, do these economic policy paradigms take? Um, I think sort of the, the practical embodiment of economic policy paradigms are, are these terms, of course, that, that we've all heard and we use and um, have preoccupied policymakers in different uh, periods of time or different parts of the world. They are sort of things like mercantilism as a way of doing economic policy, or classical liberalism, uh, welfare state Keynesianism, um, market socialism, uh, neoliberalism, you can think about populism as a form of uh, a, an economic policy paradigm. You can think about developmentalism um, or economic nationalism uh, as sort of a kind of paradigm. I, I'm not going to go through each one of these um, uh, paradigms, but I'll, I'll just talk briefly uh, about three of those uh, because they kind of a, a, a provide a, a nice set of, of, of uh, evolution of, of ideas. Classical liberalism, of course, was, um, was a, a, a kind of a, a reaction in the form that, that at its root in Adam Smith's ideas about economics and economic policy um, was a reaction to mercantilist ideas or an earlier policy paradigm, mercantilism. Um, and Adam Smith's central claim uh, was that the markets and private initiative are really the engine that creates uh, economic prosperity. That's the core of the belief uh, about how the ec economy works. Um, that economic well-being is measured um, not by wealth, by gold or trade surpluses, but the satisfaction of individual preferences, particularly over their consumption. Um, and in the typical textbook renditions uh, of this view, uh, it sort of presumes a very minimal state uh, that provides simply a, um, a very narrow range of public goods, such as national defense, uh, the protection of property rights, um, and the administration of justice. Um, this, of course, was not uh, Adam Smith's own views. And Adam Smith had a, had a much more expansive view of the role of the government. But that's sort of you know, uh, you know, one of the problems of paradigms I'm going to come back to is by the time any set of reasonable ideas turn into paradigms, they might actually have gone overboard and oversimplified. I think this sort of vision of classical liberalism, of course, today resonates uh, with the um, contemporary uh, libertarian vision on economics, uh, which essentially views markets or the economy as separate and disembedded from politics, and again, uh, gives the state a very limited role, um, both because the state is assumed to have very limited knowledge or ability to fix problems that might exist in the economy, uh, but also that because the state is given uh, to political capture and the rent, and the rent speak, uh, um, seeking. And in any case, um, the market failures or the other problems that might otherwise require state intervention um, are, are, are not, are, 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 are thought of being essentially uh, rather limited uh, in scope and importance. The Keynesian uh, welfare state uh, vision for economic policy that, that dominated much of the post-Second World War period in the advanced 
industrial economies of the world, um, in turn was in many ways a response to uh, the failures of classical liberalism. And its central set of claims were in fact that markets are not self-creating, they're not self-regulating, they're not self-stabilizing, and they're not self-legitimizing. And of course the, the empirical background to this was the, um, the, the Great Depression and the interwar turmoil uh, that sort of in the context of which um, it wasn't that hard to understand why markets left to their own uh, would not produce um, the kind of, of um, classical liberals um, um, uh, uh, utopia. Uh, it was also, of course, a vision that arose out of um, the, uh, the, the emergence of uh, organized labor, um, the expansion of franchise, therefore um, an increase in the number of stakeholders and interest groups to which policy uh, had to respond, and of course sort of um, the rise of, of mass media, uh, which made economic policy much more a subject for um, everybody rather than a very narrow elite. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this paradigm, this particular paradigm, um, asserted uh, that markets needed to be embedded in a very wide range of institutions uh, to counter these failures of markets. Uh, so you needed um, a wide range of regulatory institutions to ensure that you could create those markets. Um, you needed redistributive institutions um, uh, and monetary and fiscal institutions to stabilize markets. And you needed a variety of institutions of conflict management to legitimize uh, markets and their outcomes. So in practice, you might want to think about, or I think about this sort of um, uh, uh, paradigm as, as a combination of, of Keynesian ideas, um, the welfare state, um, and a wide range of industrial policies, or you know, active policies to structure, restructure economies. Okay? Of course, these had different variants. So political scientists, for example, make a distinction between liberal versus coordinated market economies, that is US versus Europe in the post-war period, but that's really um, a kind of a, a subdivision under this heading rather than a major division in and of itself. And I think importantly, the Keynesian welfare state paradigm um, implicitly, um, and I've actually in the case of Keynes, quite explicitly understood or, or understood capitalism as a, as a national system rather than a global one. Um, so the post-war Bretton Woods regime for the global economy did encourage significant amount of globalization in terms of expansion of trade and long-term investment. But it was understood that the rules were going to be made mostly at the national level. Um, and Keynes, for example, was very explicit that the kinds of capital controls that he advocated um, and introduced uh, in the initial set of arrangements that would prevail um, in the post-war period, these capital controls were not simply a temporary um, expedient, that they were there permanently to ensure that national monetary and fiscal policies had the maneuvering room, had the autonomy uh, to manage their economies, um, not threatened by uh, fickle capital flows. Of course, so, you know, echoes of the 1930s when financial markets had been extremely unstable. Um, and in, in the trade regime, of course, the counterpart of this Keynesian understanding of the important role of capital controls was that in the trade regime, the GATT uh, was a very thin set of international trade rules, allowing countries to engage in a significant amount of autonomous trade policy actions and industrial policies uh, without um, uh, global uh, disciplines from multilateral trade institutions. Um, Finally, of course, neoliberalism, or what has come to be called neoliberalism, uh, itself is a response to the, um, uh, the perceived failures of the post-war uh, Keynesian social welfare uh, paradigm um, that, that sort of, um, you know, um, uh, came to a peak in the late 1970s and the early um, 80s um, by the consequences of the uh, um, oil crisis, um, the stamplation, and the debt crisis of the early 1980s, and the claim with which sort of, you know, that, that, you know, the, the, that claim for neoliberalism was that basically um, Keynesianism, Keynesianism doesn't work, 
Uh, it's not the aggregate demand that matters, it's aggregate supply. Uh, markets have become over-regulated and states have become over-extended and therefore the remedy becomes um, uh, policies of stabilization, fiscal author author austerity, central bank independence, simple monetary fiscal rules, privatization, um, and a significant amount of deregulation in the form of labor market flexibility, financialization, removal of price controls, trade liberalization, and, and so forth. Uh, the developing country version of this was, of course, the, the Washington consensus. And just as this paradigm uh, gained ground in domestic economic policy, it also found expression uh, in a different model of globalization, uh, which I've called hyper-globalization. Um, and hyper-globalization was faced, was um, uh, 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 sort of entailed the overhauling uh, on the uh, capital flow side with the presumption that capital controls would be uh, a, 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 a regular feature um, of the international economy and therefore pushed for financial globalization, um, the removal of capital controls. And on the trade side, uh, with the movement towards World Trade Organization and the, uh, the, the mushrooming of, of regional and bilateral trade, free trade agreements, a kind of a, an approach to world trade that pushed for increasing harmonization and narrowing of the policy space uh, for domestic governments um, uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that very much went against the spirit of the, um, uh, the, the earlier Bretton Woods era. Um, the Eurozone and the single uh, market um, in, in Europe was, of course, sort of the, the European version, uh, the continental European version of this idea uh, within, within Europe. So um, none of this is, is really particularly new, uh, but this, the, there are a couple of, of points that I want to stress with this very um, uh, quick overview. Uh, one is that, that really sort of there are many different versions of market economy, indeed uh, capitalism. And I could have told the story by adding sort of East Asian style developmentalism to the story, talking about market socialism, um, or talking about um, um, uh, some other uh, po well, populism and so forth. So uh, in this story, each version, each of the paradigm is really partly a reaction to the shortcomings of the previous one. Um, and each version is based uh, on a set of maintained assumptions about um, which economic structures matter, what are the implicit values, and what are the problems that we ought to, to prioritize. Um, there is, in each one of these paradigms, I think, interestingly, there's a, there's a kind of a, a mutually reinforcing interaction between ideas and interests. Um, so we think in political economy that there are sort of there's this, you know, vested interests to drive um, uh, uh, policies, and therefore you can sort of read the um, policy implications of any particular configuration of power in society or, or vested interest uh, by just looking at sort of where power lies. Uh, but I think this so the story of this uh, shifting paradigms, I think, also um, makes it clear that we also have to ask the question, where do the vested interests get their ideas? about economic policy, and that in part comes from the prevailing paradigms. Uh, so vested interests in part get their ideas about what good economic policy, what could further their interests uh, by buying uh, into uh, different paradigms and different types um, of, of, of facts. So there's this, that ideas and vested interests reinforce themselves, and when you have this paradigmatic shift in economic policy, they become mutually reinforced. Another way of saying the same thing is that, well, is, as, you know, um, uh, you know, you know uh, those of us who are in the business of writing about such things to comfort ourselves and make that new ideas can be particularly powerful uh, in periods of uncertainty because those are the periods when, in fact, vested interests, corporations, big banks, have unclear ideas about where their interests are. Um, and part of it, you can see how, you know, how quickly the business sector has adjusted, for example, to the talks about nearshoring and French frontshoring in the United States, not because the U.S. government actually makes them do it, because not, but because now they have a very different understanding of how the world works. And you can see um, this effect, um, the, uh, the, the reinforcing effects of ideas and interests. So um, 
do we need a, a, a new paradigm today? Um, so here I come to my caveat that I'm really talking about economic policy and not economics. Now, um, I'd like to argue that contemporary economic theory is actually remarkably flex flexible and admits almost an infinite variety of our policy remedies. When I was a graduate student in economics, I came across this quote, and I keep using it. Um, this was from uh, a Carlos Diaz Alejandro, uh, economics historian at Yale and Columbia, and he wrote, by now, any bright graduate student, by choosing his assumptions carefully, can produce a consistent model yielding just about any policy recommendation he favored at the start. That was published in 1974, right? So imagine what today's bright graduates are saying. Um, and um, now, you might think of this as a kind of a, um, well, a weakness of mainstream economics. After all, if you can come up with any conclusion you want by building your assumptions carefully, I would argue that it's actually the, um, the strength because it gives you sort of, you know, especially the strong point of economics is that it's the ability to derive contextual, context-specific policy conclusions. And the, I, you know, the, the point of these alternative models is to be very clear about what you're assuming about economic structure and behavior. And that gives theoretical rigor. It also gives you a sense of what must be true in the real world for your policy conclusions to follow. So rather than this being a sign of emptiness, it's a sign of SR being, you know, thinking carefully and rigorously about under what conditions, what policy conclusions are going to hold. And good economics actually combines that kind of theoretical rigor, sort of different models of the world, um, and a, a way of navigating among those models, with good empirical evidence about what works uh, in different kinds of settings. Um, and in fact, one thing that we are finding out in much increasingly more sophisticated and careful empirical evidence about what works is that what works in one setting doesn't work in another setting. Um, and that, of course, should not be a surprise in light of this particular uh, quote. Going one step further, I would say that, in fact, contemporary economic tools come paradigm-free uh, when you are thinking about paradigms in terms of an economic policy, um, and uh, that they can be used to support a very large uh, paradigm, a uh, large variety of paradigms. Um, Furthermore, um, I would say against myself, and I'm going to argue against the need for, uh, in favor of a new paradigm for policy, there are sort of downsides uh, to paradigms. I, I mentioned this already um, at the beginning of my uh, talk, that by the time any idea becomes conventional wisdom, uh, it tends to turn into a set of cookie cutter solutions uh, with a lot of blind spots that render them inappropriate to specific contexts. So it wasn't that neoliberalism was completely silly. Um, it was responding to actual failings of our previous understanding. It was just that we took that as the only way of thinking about the world, rather than understanding that sometimes we have to move across these different models of the world. Yes, the Keynesian model didn't do a good job ex at explaining what was happening in the stagflation of the late 1970s. Uh, but, you know, 15, 20 years later, the Keynesian model would actually become very, you know, much more helpful than any um, uh, supply side or, 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 or rational expectations, uh, um, uh, classical, new classical model um, that had become paradigmatic um, uh, by that time. So, I will then preface what I'm going to say for the rest of my presentation by um, uh, saying, beware economists wearing policy paradigms, that's me. Um, but, um, I will ask your indulgence in following me because of the view that I do think that we still need a kind of an animating vision for policy. That is, that, you know, that, that has to be provided by someone. I don't think economists are particularly, um, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily up to economists to provide the paradigm here because for reasons I just stated, it really transcends uh, the professional skills of economists. Um, but um, but it's, I think it's, it's incumbent on all of us to think about this because uh, we do need an animating uh, vision, um, and I just want to um, highlight my own. So uh, the premise for this is then that, that the world uh, is 
not going to be, uh, the world is going to be fundamentally different. Uh, we have geopolitical realities um, uh, that have changed. Uh, we have the realization that the climate transition uh, better be upon us, um, that, that market-based policies are not going to be, um, uh, they're going to be a test part of the solution. And then uh, for reasons that I will say a little bit more, that our existing uh, models for how to run the global economy um, for the welfare state and for economic growth and development are actually um, have, have run their course, that these ideas um, have been, um, they're in inadequate and that a change in course is indeed uh, inevitable. I'll just give you um, very briefly sort of, you know, a, a couple of, of um, different aspects of where I think we need, or the problems that we need to handle. Um, I think the, 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 for me one of the most important problems is, is what uh, economists have called uh, labor market polarization, uh, the fact that the combination of technological change and new modes of globalization have essentially um, led to a significant weakening of the middle class base of uh, societies. And here you can see there's sort of the decline uh, in the pay of uh, occupations in the middle of the um, uh, income distribution. These are largely production workers, sales and clerical workers and so forth that have done very badly in the last uh, few decades. Uh, this is um, especially so in the United States, uh, but it's a phenomenon that exists in a lot of other countries too. Um, a related problem is that um, manufacturing uh, is no longer uh, and this has been true now for, for a very long time, but that, that um, uh, manufacturing, which was the sort of classic mechanism for creating middle classes, um, is, is, is become um, weaker and weaker. Employment industrialization has, uh, has been the feature of practically all middle and um, advanced economies in the world. And very importantly, even in countries that maintain ever stronger manufacturing sectors, um, measured by value added, their contribution to total GDP, the share of employment in manufacturing continues to shrink. Um, and here you can see this very drastically in the case of South Korea, the, the, the country that I've, been, that I've circled here, where at constant prices the share of manufacturing in GDP has, has continued to increase, um, but the share of employment has plummeted uh, quite significantly. Of course, what's happening is that, that basically uh, new technologies, automation, um, and the increasingly skill and capital buys um, of uh, manufacturing means that manufacturing is, cannot absorb labor. It becomes the labor uh, sharing sector, regardless of how well you're doing um, in competition in manufacturing on the global market. So, um, the, the paradigm that I'm going to be talking about uh, is, um, is, is fundamentally focuses on on good jobs. The idea is that uh, inclusive prosperity today requires not just economy-wide productivity, but actually more productive jobs for the bulk of the labor force. So that means actually addressing inequality where it is created, because inequality is created in the productive sphere um, through the earnings that people um, uh, uh, generate through their work. Um, and, and so this put, means putting focus on uh, the productive sphere of the economy rather than on uh, redistribution uh, or transfer of resources indirectly through transfers and, and social support. Uh, so this entails a, a, a moving closer to the vision of social justice that Michael Sandel has called contributive justice. So in other words, we want to give people an opportunity to contribute to society. And one of the main ways in which we contribute is to the work that we do. So there's a focus on contributive justice as opposed to distributive justice, just a question of who is getting what. Um, so uh, I think it, it goes without saying, but I think economists consistently undervalue this fact that jobs are not just a source of income. Uh, they are also a source of personal dignity, a, person, a source of personal social recognition and, and fulfillment that in the language of economists, jobs enter not just through the income they provide and they relax from the budget constraints, but they are directly in our utility function. 
Um, and um, in terms of studies of um, uh, perceived life satisfaction, nothing can hit a person worse than actually losing a job. Again, a fundamental uh, feature that is not um, taken into account in our standard um, uh, um, uh, economic um, models. Um, again, you know, sort of these studies have found that to compensate somebody who's lost a job through income transfers, you actually need to, um, you know, give them income equivalent to four or seven times their actual income, um, so that that's multiples of income transfers as required. Okay, so we are, so we know that that you know jobs matter for from a utilitarian perspective. Uh, they also um, uh, uh, matter from the first from the view of um, the impact of good jobs or alternatively loss of good jobs can have to local communities. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a variety of studies going back to uh, Bill Wilson's study um, of experience of jobs in, in um, uh, Chicago uh, that how through trade automation and austerity shocks, disappearance of jobs in particular regions has been linked to a variety of social and political ills such as rising crime, um, uh, higher rates of addiction, uh, uh, broken families, higher rates of suicide, and then politically, um, the increasing support for right-wing, nativist, populist, uh, authoritarian movements, and increasing authoritarian values. So all of this to say that, that, that sort of the presence of good jobs is a fundamental determinant of, of social cohesiveness, and, um, and, and the disappearance of good jobs uh, is, is, again, in the language of, of an economist, is a source of great negative externalities for local communities. So what might that uh, a good job strategy, one that focuses exclusively on the ability uh, to create productive employment for the bulk of the labor force, what might that look like? Um, I'm going to uh, exemplify this approach by sort of contrasting it with alternative, with our current alternatives, so the ways that we are used to thinking about good jobs. And I'll use this policy matrix uh, that distinguishes, on the one hand, um, sort of the three um, levels of policy intervention, um, sort of whether we intervene in the pre-production stage of the economy, uh, the production stage directly, or post-production. Uh, so this is a kind of a, a generalization or, or, or um, somewhat similar to the distinction that you might know between pre-distribution and distribution, except that, so the pre-distribution here coincides with pre-production, but I'm splitting the distribution stage into a production phase and a post-production stage. This is our somewhat uh, richer presentation. And then along the, um, uh, the horizontal um, uh, axis, um, sort of distinguishing among three different segments of the economy, the low productivity, middle productivity, and high productivity uh, uh, segments. So uh, in any real economy, of course, this matrix is full with a variety of policies. I'm not going to be talking about that, but sort of, you know, sort of spending on education for low-income families, for example, will be in the, in the top um, uh, left corner. Um, sort of wealth taxes uh, would essentially be in the, in, the, in, the, in the bottom right corner and so forth. Um, so our traditional uh, growth strategies, our traditional growth policies, uh, essentially largely focus on the high productivity segment uh, of the economy uh, with our sort of focus on the trade, our innovation systems, our R&D policies, our subsidies, our corporate policies, and so forth. Um, I think uh, the, where we have reached the limit of these traditional growth policies um, uh, is, um, is some of the things that I've already talked about. On the one hand, you know, we've reached uh, sort of this, this, you know, sort of this extreme levels of employment deindustrialization means that even if you're successful in terms of creating very productive firms at the um, high-end segment of the economy that can compete uh, in the global market, um, that has that risk creating a highly dualized, polarized economy because those are segments that are not absorbing a lot of labor. Uh, so it's not producing um, a, a kind of an inclusive economy. So the, the consequences of this 
uh, traditional draft model would be a, a form of productive dualism. Um, and, and, and extensive and, 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 and increase in labor market polarization. And so this is, we're already seeing this, for example, in a, in a sort of wider gap opening up in productivity levels of the largest and most productive firms and the rest of the economy, or, or the rest of the firms, even uh, either, even within uh, identical sectors um, and, and, and lower la levels of dissemination of productivity gains. And I would say that this is, um, a, this is this kind of productive dualism that we're used to thinking of as a feature of developing countries, of low-income countries, is increasingly has become a feature of advanced countries as well. Um, the welfare state model, on the other hand, uh, focuses on very different cells. Uh, that it focuses, on the one hand, in um, investments in education and training and public spending on sort of um, higher education. So these are sort of the pre-production cells. On the other hand, it, 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 it focuses on, you know, post-production redistribution uh, through the tax and transfer scheme, uh, along with sort of macro, overall macroeconomic stabilization to ensure uh, full employment for everybody, including uh, low-income people. Uh, the limits of the welfare state model uh, is that, that basically the traditional welfare state model, that sort of that paradigm, assumes that good middle class jobs are going to be available to most of the workforce uh, if we provide this workforce with adequate levels of education. And therefore, all that we need to focus on are really focus on our, our spending on education, on health, on pensions, and social insurance against idiosyncratic risk, um, which are sort of these are the, the, uh, the pre and post production cells uh, in the matrix before. But I think increasingly uh, today, uh, the kind of uh, problems of inequality, insecurity, labor market polarization is much more of a structural problem uh, that arises from uh, the inadequacy of or the shortage, relative shortage of good middle class jobs uh, uh, due to these trends in technology, long standing uh, trends in deindustrialization and globalization. So when technology and globalization follow up, the middle of the employment distribution, we have a structural problem that will exhibit itself in the permanent bad jobs in depressed regional labor markets, and therefore will need a different strategy that tackles the good job creation directly. And the traditional welfare state policies are not adequate um, to address uh, this, this problem. Okay. So the good jobs policies then uh, would be a combination of, 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 of things. Um, it's based on the presumption that simply uh, decreeing good jobs through higher minimum wages, better standards, uh, while important, is not going to be enough because absent productivity growth for those workers whose jobs we want to improve is going to be a trade-off between better working conditions and employment levels. So, for example, a country like France, which has very high levels of employment protection and high levels of worker standards, is really stuck in a bad equilibrium where these same uh, uh, policies also exclude a very large segment of youth labor force from employment uh, because uh, there is not commensurate with high product, uh, productivity uh, for those workers. So good jobs for all, therefore, is possible only with a wider dissemination of these productive benefits or new, te new technologies. So good jobs, therefore, is going to require also some you know, good firms on the demand side to create those good jobs. Um, but because good firms do not internalize uh, the social consequences of their employment decisions, um, uh, there's, you know, we need to essentially think of a quid pro quo between the states and firms that uh, the state provides a range of public inputs uh, to enhance productivity for firms in exchange for the commitment of firms uh, to expand their employment and the creation of good jobs. So in terms of this, this matrix, um, good jobs policies essentially are uh, in the center of this matrix, uh, targeting sort of production level interventions um, for the middle productivity segment of the economy. Uh, the key elements uh, would be uh, active labor market policies that are explicitly linked to employers as workforce development for uh, uh, programs that work together with employers um, and therefore are, are, are linked both to their needs but also have the ability to get the employers to create jobs uh, in line with the existing uh, set of skills. Uh, 
a broader range of industrial, regional, and place-based policies that target the creation of good jobs. Uh, innovation and technology policies that, that are explicitly targeted uh, toward the um, generation or the stimulation of labor and new technologies. Um, and then all of that supported by international economic policies that give nations the right uh, to protect uh, domestic labor social standards and the right to prevent those standards being undercut uh, when um, uh, domestic uh, labor standards come under, co under, uh, under threat from countries where labor rights are grossly uh, violated. Um, so these good jobs policies are, are connected by both by a, a common objective of, of focusing on the creation of good jobs, but also a new form of, of governance. Uh, it, that is a relationship between state and the state agency and the private um, and, and, and civic uh, sector. Uh, that is that um, it entails a greater degree of coordination um, between these um, business incentives and innovation incentives on the one hand and labor market policies on the other. It entails the provision of customized business services uh, such as um, uh, um, you know, you know, greenfield sites or, or management training or uh, particular types of workforce training instead of tax incentives or fiscal incentives. Um, a, at least a good faith effort on the part of firms um, to, um, to live up to commitments with respect to the uh, job upgrading and the creation of good jobs and also a kind of a collaborative iterative relationship where these relationships can be updated in light of, of new evidence and changing, uh, uh, changing uh, conditions. Now, this all will sound very abstract, um, uh, and um, I, I've written about some of the details of this in the context of the U.S. I've also a couple of short pieces on this for the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the U.K., um, and um, uh, I, for the purposes of my presentation, I want to suggest um, just a, a general uh, orientation of policy rather than go into the details of what some of the specific uh, programs uh, might look like. I'm just going to conclude uh, by um, briefly um, citing four different, um, I think, advantages um, of this kind of an agenda or this kind of economic policy paradigm. Uh, one is that this is an explicitly uh, structuralist approach. Uh, that is, uh, it aims to shape production, and innovation, and employment incentives uh, of the private sector where those decisions are actually being made, uh, rather than taking them as given and then redistributing income uh, after the fact. Okay? So that's the sense in which it is moving away, not necessarily uh, undermining the welfare state, but saying that, that so there's an additional dimension that is needed that is much more directly targeting the productive sphere of the economy. The second, I think, is that this way of thinking of uh, these good jobs policies as this cooperative, ongoing, iterative relationship between various state agencies and the private sector and the civic sector uh, is that it breaks through this kind of institutional fetishism that that preoccupies at least the economist's mind between sort of markets on the one hand and the state uh, on the other. Because when you start looking at how your approach to create good jobs, these traditional conceptions or distinctions between markets and the state, regulation versus the free market no longer apply. Instead, you have a, a set of processes, a sort of collab collaborative, iterative rule making um, uh, that tries to uh, take advantage and also respond uh, to um, a high dimension of uncertainty that exists in, in the sphere. Third, I would say that um, an advantage of this framework is that it does not separate out the growth agenda from the social agenda, uh, because a, a, a feature of this uh, is the understanding that an, the economy, the growth of the economy, is really possible only through the dissemination of more productive methods um, throughout a larger segment of the labor force and throughout the uh, regions of the economy that have been left out. And on the other hand, uh, you create greater equity and inclusion precisely by creating better jobs uh, for uh, the lower and lower middle income uh, segments of the, of the workforce. And finally, and probably the sort of the most 
ambitious aspect of this, if you will, is that it opens up the possibilities of a rather more radical institutional reform uh, from somewhat gradualist uh, beginnings. Uh, so it avoids this you know, you know, eternal question of how do we stand, how do we change our system? Uh, do we change it to gradualism or, or revolution? But when you think about this system uh, of how uh, policies can be made and implemented, it's really one that builds on existing cross-sectoral collaborative effects that already exist, um, but, in, but, but, but enlarging on them, expanding on them, and making them uh, much more explicitly a model uh, for the future economy. So it leaves open the path uh, for much greater uh, and much more radical institutional changes along the way as well, uh, without us necessarily needing to be utopian about what we can achieve from, from the get-go. So uh, let me just uh, stop here and look forward to your questions, um, and thanks for your patience. Okay, great. Thank you for the uh, fantastic and enlightening uh, presentation. So we have plenty of time for questions, and I know from previous sessions in the day that people are absolutely jam-packed with questions uh, for Professor Danny Roderick. Uh, so, um, goodness, there you go, lots of people. Okay, so um, I think the first question is here, so let's take maybe two or three questions. Uh, okay, yeah, fire away. Hello, thank you for your presentation. My name is Emiliano, fourth-year student in a PhD in geography. And I have two questions. The first one is, you mentioned that uh, economic, contemporary economic policy tools are free from paradigms and can be used to support different paradigms. So my question there would be, how are some of the tools of the good, what makes the tools of the good jobs paradigm specific to it? And what would be the risk that these tools are used for other economic paradigms? And the second question is, um, speaking of economic growth agendas, um, what would be your uh, thinking or about, for example, the growth in the fossil industry? Um, do we need more good jobs in fossil industries or the growth in the sector overall? Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, the second question is easier. I don't think we need growth in the fossil fuel sector. No, I think we definitely need to shrink that. That's an existential question. Um, so my, 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 my comments did not really focus on the climate transition much, so I take it for... I, I take it as given, so I don't know. Well, this one, so sorry. Yeah. So I, I is this working? Is this working? Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, I. You know. So I think um, the the climate transition agenda is largely uh, sort of. Uh, complementary to what this is. I, I think about the climate agenda as sort of the most important existential threat that we face to our you know, physical environment. And, and the kind of social problems that our, the labor market distress has created in the last 20, 30 years is probably the greatest threat to our social and political life. So uh, there's a sense in which, um, but of course I, my talk has emphasized the, uh, the good jobs aspect. So I don't want to, I think that realistically what we're going to have is that um, our climate transition policies are going to add to these problems because a lot of the jobs in, in the, in the um, areas that rely on, 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 on traditional sources of energy will have to disappear. So that would be an additional uh, concern, an additional reason that we want to ensure that these kinds of good jobs policies are in place, that we can replace those jobs uh, uh, with productive jobs and other kinds of services. Um, so I forgot what was the first question. Um, you have mentioned that economic tools are paradigm-free and can be used to support different paradigms. What makes good jobs, economic tools, specific to jo good jobs and um, not for other paradigms, for example? Well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, a certain number of um, uh, uh, maintained, you know, sort of there's a certain number of assumptions that go into why we sit, sit needed these tools and so that, that come from specific so, for example, that there are these social, that there are these social externalities from good jobs, and therefore you need to find ways of encouraging good jobs. Um, and then you say, well, if there's an externality, why don't you just simply apply a Gregorian uh, subsidy, just give everybody a you know, subsidy for creating new jobs, 
then there is something else that comes in. It's like, you know, there's, we live in a world where there is sort of high dimensional uncertainty when there's a lot of uncertainty about the, the, the kind of technologies that firms could have access to, the magnitude of these externalities, what are the best strategies that are available. Um, just simply using a Pigovian subsidy actually doesn't use enough information or, and therefore you want to think about this as a more of an iterative process where you're actually learning more about the environment as you're applying different kinds of policies. So that particular theoretical model leads you to this kind of a different kind of policies which are much more collaborative and iterative rather than the traditional top-down ex-ante model of arm's length model of regulation. So each one of these conclusions follow from particular views of the world with particular models. Um, and I think that's sort of the link. Um, now, I haven't done the, the mapping in the other direction. So, but the mapping goes from particular models of the world to what their policy implications would be. Okay, so we have a question from this side. Uh, yes. I don't think you referred to land reform um, in your presentation. Uh, and the World Bank and the IMF, um, to a certain extent, referred to the correlation between ownership of land and poverty, instances of poverty. Now, that's particularly the reference to developing countries, but uh, I wonder whether you think that is really something that's really in the developed countries as well, and whether we want to impact because obviously the stewardship of land is going to become more and more urgent with the climate crisis. And I just want to your thoughts on that. I think, I think, I mean, an honest answer would be that I haven't thought much about it in the context of the US industrial economy, so you know, I, I don't want to say something about that. Um, it could be that in certain settings, uh, extreme concentration of land in the working households might be the most important binding constraint to achieving the wider dissemination of, 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 of productivity. Um, I, I, want to, I want to be agnostic on that because um, I think uh, many other things also play a role. Um, we know that in some, you know, in, in, in countries like uh, uh, South Korea and, and sorry, and Taiwan, some, you know, previous land reform and some of the things that. Um, so it, 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 I think again, I, I will take refuge in the in the, in the, the contextual economy of the world. It, 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 it's hard to say something very objective. All right. Um, yes. We can pass the mic to the center. Thank you. Thanks for the interesting talk. So, I'm a lawyer, not an economist. So, my question is given that you connect this idea of good jobs to the value of work, right? So, the dignity of the workers, the self identity, civic identity, participation in uh, civil rights and democratic rights, even. And you also sort of focus the idea of the good jobs and then agenda with a cooperative element between the public and the private sector. Do you see a role as part of this agenda in the reinvigoration of collective autonomy? So the reinvigoration of collective processes, trade unionism, collective bargaining, not necessarily in the sense of collective less effort, but in a sense of a reinvigoration, because that's the one thing that was missing from your presentation. Thank you. I mean, I can certainly see how, in, in certain contexts, that is um, an, uh, an element of um, sort of, you know, the, the, the collective um, uh, assertion of rights, the collective development of the vision, uh, the collective problem solving could take the form of, um, you know, trade unionization, or that becomes the vehicle. In some other setting, it could be something else. So, you know, it's. Uh, so I want to remain, again, institutionally agnostic about what form it might take. Uh, but what is clear is that, that you need that, you know, th this, this process that I've, I've described requires uh, uh, the existence of some coordination mechanism. Who provides that coordination mechanism? What institution is? Uh, that's really open-ended. Sometimes it could be a community leader, a civic leader. Sometimes it could be um, a, a chamber of commerce. Um, sometimes it could be you know, a local trade union. So it could be all of these things. And, and um, so that's entirely possible. And I think, you know, I, um, 
for a number of years, I used to teach a course with um, uh, Roberto Mangabe Unger um, in, in, um, uh, at the Kennedy School, and he's always viewed this kind of experimentalism as a way of developing a much richer set of legal arrangements in society that's also, that's also experimental and also evolving. So I think that, 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 map, that, that uh, meshes well uh, with this kind of, um, a, 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 you know, sort of an experimentalist legal approach, uh, uh, approach as well. Yes, please. Thank you for your presentation. presentation. Um, was that okay? My question is how to how to create good job policy in the face of a large policy incentive, like tech giants, when powerful businesses have the option not to not to engage in this good job policy. How do we create a structures or incentive to make them engage in this good job policy? That they want? Thank you. It's not entirely clear that. Um, you remember that, that, you know, sort of my description, so, you know, there's a famous uh, sort of, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Treaty of Detroit conception of, uh, you know, American labor market institution that goes back to that sort of the earlier paradigm where it was understood that, that you know, part of the job of labor, part of the job of large corporations was to work very close with their communities and with their workers and with their suppliers, that they had a sense of responsibility. Uh, to these groups, uh, an understanding of what corporations are for that you know dissipated um, after the 1980s and 1990s, when you know uh, you know this uh, shareholder view or shareholder um, uh, 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 value maximization uh, vision of what corporations are about became the dominant view. Uh, I, 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 I mentioned that earlier conception because it ties up with one of the themes that I had in the early part. Um, I think there's a, there is you know sort of Powerful interests, their you know sort of their views of where their interests are also come from the prevailing narratives about society, and so I find it a little bit less of an inherent obstacle that uh, large corporations are large and therefore they are powerful and they, they have interests. Um, I find that as a less constraining um, uh, um, you know sort of fact about the world about how we can change the world because it's really also that they can start having very different visions of where their interests lie. And I think that the, that, that narrative would, would start by saying that, look, you know, that it's, it's, it's not, in some ways, it's a vision that they're already internalizing because they've understood that it's no longer these footloose corporations that can go anywhere and they can rely on this completely global supply chains and that, that, that they will need to behave, these large corporations need to behave in a somewhat different ways. Now, the neoliberal version of that was ESG. Um, that is basically doing a few things to look for. I think we need to, we'll need to go beyond ESG to have a much formal uh, um, sort of standards. Uh, but I think, you know, sort of large corporations, know that they can make money under any kind of regulatory structure as long as they have a certain degree, a good understanding of what that, that, that you know, that framework and that structure is. So uh, I, I, I don't find it as, that, that is some, some major obstacle that we have organizers of power. Large corporations you know, would be the beneficiaries of many of these good jobs policies because they have access to many of the things um, that strong labor markets and, and, and good strong collaboration with the uh, state can provide. Everything from property rights to intellectual property rights to trained workforce to local infrastructure and, and all of that. And that's part of the quid pro quo. Um, but that has to be made clear to the corporations that that's the kind of world in which we live in. And I guess there's an issue that is implicit in both of the two previous questions, uh, which maybe comes down to the question of uh, to what extent is it a labor productivity problem and to what extent is it a distribution problem? Because someone like Piketty might argue that, well, you have industries that have achieved a lot in terms of labor productivity, but those reduced costs haven't necessarily fed through into returns to labor rather than into profit. So that's, that's, I'm glad you put it in that way, and that's a great question. Uh, I would say that increased productivity uh, is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition uh, for creating the kind of, you know, sort of you know, inclusive prosperity and the dissemination of good jobs. Um, and indeed, we have seen in the United States where um, in many sectors of the economy, 
average labor productivity has increased very rapidly while wages have stagnated uh, for um, high school workers. And, and so that has been a failure of the institutions, of labor market institutions, to ensure that the benefits of productivity have been appropriately shared. So I don't want to uh, uh, underemphasize the importance of those very hard won gains in labor market institutions, labor standards, institutionalization of labor markets, and minimum wage policies, and so forth. Those are very important, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, sort of, you know, you need as a necessary condition, um, you know, sort of, the, the, you know, the underlying increase in productivity, uh, then which then can be appropriately shared. But it is a good point that, that um, so I hope it's clear that nothing that I've said suggests that you want to go back um, on the gains of, of sort of, you know, um, that organized labor um, has made and our understanding that you need countervailing, countervailing power in labor markets, otherwise, um, uh, the benefits will accrue mostly um, uh, to corporations and the shareholders. Um, but the other risk that we can take is to say that that's the only way we can achieve this. And if you don't have the underlying, so um, the kinds of jobs that are available for relatively most skilled workers aren't of high enough productivity, even if that is uh, um, uh, the, the, the distribution within the enterprise is appropriate, that's still not going to result in high, high wage and high benefits. A real risk to the good jobs uh, agenda is the possibility that artificial intelligence and emerging technologies mean that uh, you know jobs that would uh, would be created, the in particular middle productivity jobs, might be automated uh, or not you know not arise in the first place. How does the how does the set of policies that would enable uh, the the growth from artificial intelligence, the augmentation of productivity, and that productivity dividend to uh, it'd be realized by workers and not just by firms and capital. That's great. I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think the way to do it is to start thinking about the direction of technological change as not completely exogenous or given by forces outside our control. Um, so um, the kind of technologies that we want to invest in in order to support the kinds of good jobs policies that I described would be um, uh, digital tools or AI or other new technologies uh, that actually complement uh, what lower middle school, uh, lower middle skill workers can do rather than replace them. Uh, so that gives them the ability to do things that they would not otherwise be doing rather than replace them. There are lots of those kinds of opportunities that are in principle uh, possible across the entire economy. So in manufacturing, for example, we know from the works of operation uh, um, uh, uh, scholars that firms typically face a, a kind of an envelope of different types of technology choices, some of which use more labor, some of which use, use less labor. You know, when, uh, you know, um, Elon Musk thought that he could produce uh, you know, Tesla Model 3 completely without any labor, you know, he ended up almost bankrupting his firm and just, you know, created, had to create a completely different assembly line that actually uses workers. So there is a lot of different options, technological choices that are available, and we cannot simply rely on uh, the markets or Silicon Valley or, uh, um, or large firms to invest in the right kinds of technologies. Um, the, the usual way that we can actually complement low and middle skills is by creating new tasks uh, for low skill workers that they could not have done before. Um, and so, for example, for retail workers, that might be, for example, various digital tools that allow them to provide much more customized serve, much more specialized service to customers than they would have been otherwise able to. So now they can do other things, they can do more things, um, uh, and not simply just. Um, do you know sort of what they were doing um, uh, more efficiently in in healthcare? It might be um, sort of um, long-term care nurses being able to provide much more uh, um, you know directly differentiated uh, care for their patients uh, by getting sort of real-time information about how the patients are doing and their feeding times and what they need, 
uh, that would show up in greater productivity, for example, in lower uh, you know, incidence of, of, of uh, 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 chronic uh, problems or hospital admissions that allow these uh, nurses, especially in the US who might be very low wage, to do a wider range of, of, of uh, care uh, tasks than they would otherwise be able to uh, with these kinds of technologies. Now, these are things that we already know exist, but are not being sufficiently deployed. Um, and, and, and the idea is that we work to actually put as our goal when we think about innovation policies um, as also thinking much more explicitly about what kind of technologies uh, would help lower uh, skilled, lower educated workers produce a greater range of tasks. If we put that as, as an additional uh, desirable criterion, uh, that we might generate, in fact, a lot more technologies of this kind that would actually uh, benefit lower um, uh, um, skilled workers instead of simply replacing them. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Uh, find it really interesting. I want to challenge you on your suggestion about paradigm shift. And I'm not going to be the first. I just want to remind that if we had been having this discussion four years ago, there would have been a lot of challenges along those lines, which suggests to me how far along we are in terms of rethinking the new economy. I think my question follows from your last answer, and that is, what's a good job? Uh, how do we define that? And to draw a contrast with the Treaty of Detroit, I think you have something other than the Treaty of Detroit in mind or something more. In other words, not just good wages, good job security, good pensions, good health care. In the answer to your last question, you, met, you mentioned diversifying the work that a low paid care worker might give. But could you talk to us generically about what a good job would be in this new paradigm? Because it's the linchpin of your project. And I would, I want you to help us think more about what that looks like across multiple sectors of the economy, especially sectors of the economy where jobs are going to be numerous, such as social care, but which traditionally have thought to be not on the good side of work. Which somehow, uh, I guess that my talk was long enough, and maybe it's good that I deleted it, but there was a slide that said, what's a good job? And it seems to have, to have gone. Um, so uh, I would dis define a, a good job as as um, as, as jobs that um, either provide um, a middle class um, sort of level of living or a kind of a career path uh, to a middle class um, level of living standards. And of course, already stating this makes clear that it's, it's going to be it will depend on local norms and so forth. Um, but, but it's not just about, as you say rightly, it's not just about pay. It's also about autonomy, um, predictability. It's about um, whether there's career profession, uh, career ladders, uh, whether um, how you're treated uh, by your superiors. So when you ask people what you know, sort of you know, what do they ask for in a good job, or they do they think they have a good job or not? Uh, those are the kinds of things that they will respond to, whether they're sort of. You know, they have control over their schedules. Are they being treated with respect? Are they having um, a kind of um, uh, um, a abilities to develop professionally? Uh, do they have agency? Um, uh, are they you know, doing a variety of different tasks that they find enriching? On top of the pay, which might be sort of at least half of what matters, uh, but there are these other sort of elements of those jobs. Um, and there are actually a number of different ways of quantifying these things. You can either, as in these surveys, you can ask, uh, you know, workers uh, these things and how they view. Just you can ask them in general about their perceived life satisfaction. You can ask them questions about their perceived satisfaction with respect to their jobs. Um, or you can have indicators that are actually more uh, more statistical indicators that are based on sort of you know um, you know the degree of wage compression on the job, uh, the degree of of, of uh, wage progression over the lifetime of a job, um, and um, you know the rate of the rate of turnover, for example, is often a good indicator 
Um, so, and, and indicators of both kinds actually do exist. And now that this has become something that we're paying more attention, there's actually more effort at trying to measure these things because it's only after it becomes a priority that we spend a lot of time actually trying to measure it. Um, so it is possible. I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a subjective construct, um, uh, but I think it's, um, it, it, it's possible to use it as, as a, as an indicator, as an objective also indicator for what we're trying to achieve. Hi there, I'm Lucy. I'm one of the few public policy students in the room. And I first came across your work when I studied at the London School of Economics. So I've been a fan of your work for some time. And um, my question actually is related to this very slide behind you on the second bullet point where you say, from welfare state to productive state. I think it's excellent in theory, but in practice, particularly here in the UK, I mean, for me, this is blindingly obvious that we need to move from a welfare state to a productive state. But how do you do that in practice? Because as soon as you try to say, okay, you know, we're moving to a productive state, away from a welfare state, you get all sorts of attacks. So I'm just curious how you do this in practice. So welfare state to a productive state. So I guess I'm saying not, not productive state, but a productivist state, uh, which is a, you know sort of a, a you know a state that that views its um, sort of one of the main sort of a, an animating vision for its policies is one being that sort of just creating more productive employment opportunities for um, uh, both for declining or, or left behind regions as well as. Um, uh, workers without the um, uh, with more middle um, levels of, of skills. You know, how do I get? I mean, it's just it's it's uh, you know it's 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 for the government to to take on a particular vision for the government for and to pursue it. So it's not. I don't think we should measure this by whether this an objective can be achieved within 15 days or within 30 days. It's about you know um, whether. What you're doing, this is the whole point about the discussion about economic policy paradigm, is really what, what is it that you think you're doing? Um, and I think a government that views this vision purely as one that is, um, uh, you know, repairing or maintaining a welfare state would act very differently than a government that views this vision as um, let's fix the problems of the welfare state, but on top, what we want to do is ensure that our productive structure. Uh, is okay as well because it does require different kinds of, of, of policies. Uh, is this possible? Well, I mean, it does, and I think often it happens. Often, it, you know, the labels that we give what governments are doing is are labels that we attach to them after they've changed their policies because it's just by very, by by virtue of responding to the needs of the time, governments end up doing different things, and then you know some economist or some political scientist, some historian comes by and say. Uh, you know, you know, with benefit of hindsight, we see that this was neoliberalism, or this was something else, um, and and we see this this happening. I mean, I think we're seeing this very clearly in, in the United States with uh, sort of what some some have called Bidenomics. I don't know what we're going to be calling it five, ten years from now, but it's certainly a very different approach to policy. And and so what I've presented this here is what I hope and wish Bidenomics would look like, because it's not exactly that. Yes, please. Hello, world. Um, you, you talked about international economic policy as um, one of the key features of the good jobs paradigm. And I was just wondering if you could elucidate can the good jobs paradigm exist without some form of collective international? Um, economic policy, and if so, how do we convince people who have largely rejected, people who are in need of good jobs, or those who have largely rejected um, international institutions to work to improve them for Trump and populist radical white parties? So how do we make that connection um, to increase support for international policies to those who are inclined towards the nation? I don't think you need a lot of international economic policy coordination or agreement for this. I think for the, the most important thing is that 
most of these jobs being in non-tradable services, they don't, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to come under international or import competition. Uh, so your, you know, your, your good jobs in, in, in retail, in education, in health, um, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the personal services, uh, they're not uh, tradable. And so it's not a question that, um, that, that um, those good jobs might be undermined by import competition. My argument about um, some kind of a, um, a social uh, and social, what might be called an anti-social dumping kind of a safeguard uh, is meant to be just for sort of a relatively small uh, proportion of, of manufacturing goods. And that also is something that can be done by countries on their own, just like, you know, countries, you know, prohibit the importation of goods uh, that, you know, violate domestic health and safety standards. Uh, you know, they could prohibit the importation of goods that have been produced under conditions that exploit, that are exploited to the labor. Um, that's totally within their limits, and that's what they can do. Every country can do that individually. Um, if that country does not want its labor standards in manufacturing tradable sectors uh, that are, um, are open to competition from such imports, if they don't want their workers in such sectors uh, to come under competition from uh, other jurisdictions where labor rights um, are, um, are explicitly exploitable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the, um, uh, for the uh, presentation. My question actually is uh, similar to this uh, last one. Um, it relates to the development, traditional development lands specifically uh, that was followed by um, or pursued by countries like China and Asian, uh, other Southeast Asian and Asian countries. The role of foreign direct investment uh, was substantial in uh, transferring technology, uh, upskilling the labor force, and enhancing productivity. So do you see this uh, same role of, of the eye in this new paradigm, or perhaps uh, more greater reliance on domestic capacities? Yeah, um, I think probably would play a somewhat lesser role, again, for the same reason that I think, you know, sort of most of, you know, the, the focus here being mostly on domestic services and building up domestic middle class. Um, I think it, it's, it's and, and those are areas where, um, except for maybe retail, um, FDI and technology transfer to retail has not played a huge role. That's, that's been FDI's been mostly in the countries you're talking about has played a role mostly in manufacturing. Um, so I think, and since I, I, I don't think where the manufacturer, manufacturing is where the real action is going to be, um, I think FDI, the role of FDI is, is probably a lot smaller uh, in, in this domain. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. I wonder if you could say a bit more about how you would advise economic policymakers here in the UK about the best way to move into a more collaborative and iterative rulemaking that you describe, particularly at a time when it feels like there's a rise in demand for more policy certainty and stability, perhaps unrealistically, but also a greater demand to know who's making decisions so that they can be held politically accountable. Thanks. Um, uh, I don't know that I have much to say about uh, British politics, um, but uh, I think I, I just uh, wrote a, a short piece um, with a, um, a graduate student at the Kennedy School on sort of what a version of this for the UK might look like um, that just come out or is coming out in the IPPR uh, Progressive Rev Review. I think it's already on their website. Um, so I think it, it really is um, um, a, a, I mean, some of the things that we've mentioned there, for example, is how um, employer linked or vocational training, which is one of the elements of this, um, has um, been eroded in, in the UK for a number of years. And so in real terms, it's really much, much smaller than it's ever been. So one of the key elements of this is actually, you know, sort of investing in a workforce, not in a generic way, but in a way that's actually linked to the actual demand by employers and doing sort of this training. 
And that seems to have been a, a, a tradition that has become significantly weaker, for example, that would need to be much more um, uh, ex uh, um, expanded. Um, there are sort of, the, there's a discussion on, on sort of these new investment zones, for example, that could be at the beginning of, of promoting um, these uh, sort of the more experimental local kinds of approaches. Uh, but we see very little, for example, of discussion in the context of investment zones as focusing on sectors that are going to be primarily jobs creating and job labor absorbing sectors. Uh, so it's important to not just talk about sort of the, you know, the most productive, highly skilled, tradable services, which the UK economy does very good at, or sort of the, you know, the advanced manufacturing or the biotech, but one needs to focus on where the jobs are actually going to be. And for example, we don't see the connection uh, with that in, in, in the context of, of the, the current focus on investment zone. Um, we like the area, right? What is it, the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, which is sort of, you know, modeled after DARPA. Uh, but again, it, you know, it, it doesn't, it's a missed opportunity in the sense of it doesn't focus on the kinds of the discussion we we're just having on, on labor-friendly technologies. Um, and so that would be an opportunity to put a, a different twist on, on technology, focusing much more on sort of how we can use these in, in, in retail and, and, and education and digital to create much more specialized tasks that can be done um, uh, much more uh, uh, sort of at, at lower skill levels. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that uh, they don't rise to the level of how do, how do we make British politics more effective or how do we increase the, the trust of the public and, and, and the public sector. Uh, but uh, there's sort of, you know, sort of a, a different orientation of a different kind of emphasis on, on bits and pieces of policy or institutions that already exist, but reorienting them towards these different kinds of needs. Okay, unfortunately, I can see that there are still a lot more questions, uh, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. So um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Danny, for this absolutely fantastic um, presentation and discussion on what is surely one of the most important policy issues of our time. Uh, before we finish, uh, please uh, join me uh, in making just a few acknowledgements. Um, I'd like us to take, just take a moment to acknowledge our student volunteers uh, with the microphones. Uh, a big, 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 big for all of the hard, hard work uh, in making this event possible. Um, it's something we absolutely appreciate. Uh, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy uh, for organizing this, Robinson College uh, for hosting us. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, you, our audience, uh, Mike, I am, and all of the NPP teaching team. Uh, and finally, uh, not uh, least of all, uh, a big thank you, uh, Professor Danny Roderick, uh, for joining us here tonight uh, and enlightening us uh, with these insights. Thank you.